You're listening to the second season of Breakdown, an exclusive podcast by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This season, death in a hot car, mistake or murder. Go to ajcbreakdown.com for additional background, photos, video, and more on the Justin Ross Harris case. Previously on Breakdown. Actually, the day before that day, when he woke up from nap, he looked at me and he said, I need a diaper. And... I was so excited because I'm like, okay, you're using words, you know, you're making sentences. It's a smell that I associate with a lot of death things. So, yes, it's one of those things that comes with the scene. To say that there was an odor you could detect that was indicative of something dead isn't consistent with what happens in the real world or facts. Welcome back. I'm Bill Rankin, legal affairs reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and I'm providing weekly updates of the hot car murder trial against Justin Ross Harris. As expected, we started this past week of testimony by going down into the gutter, that gutter being Ross Harris's adulterous sex life, his lurid internet chats with women he didn't know, even underaged girls. And once again, prosecutors ended the week of testimony with a bang, with lead detective Phil Stoddard on the stand, they played the recording of Harris's police interview. It gives us, for the first time, his own account of what happened the day his son died. Next, prosecutors played the recording of the emotional meeting when Harris's wife at the time, Leanna, came to see him in the same room on the night of his arrest at the police station. But more on that later. First, the gutter. As I've told you, prosecutors contend Harris was so obsessed with hooking up with multiple women that he deliberately killed his son so he could be free to pursue a lifestyle of sexual gratification. Defense attorneys say Harris simply made a mistake, an extreme error of omission, when he left Cooper to die in his SUV. They say Harris's sexual proclivities, sordid and filthy as they were, had nothing to do with his son Cooper's death. Monday morning proved to be uncomfortable for everyone in the courtroom. Those of us who followed this case from the get-go knew this moment would arrive, when prosecutors would show jurors the photo Harris took of his genitals and then message to women he wanted to have sex with. They displayed it through the testimony of a petite 17-year-old girl from Alabama. She spoke of the messages she exchanged with Harris in May 2014, little more than two weeks before Cooper's death. She was 15 years old at the time. He was 33. Judge Mary Staley Clark ordered the teen's identity be shielded from public view. She also ordered there be no audio or video recording of her testimony. So I'm going to summarize what the teenager said. And I need to issue a warning here. Some of the following content is of a graphic sexual nature and is unsuitable for children. The teenager said Harris contacted her after she posted, quote, I love older guys, unquote, on the anonymous messaging service called Whisper. Initially, she lied. She told Harris she was 18. They switched to the direct messaging service Kick, and their exchanges turned sexual. Harris eventually emailed her a photo of his erect penis. She responded by sending him a photo she took of her own genital area. Lead prosecutor Chuck Boring then picked up a manila file folder. He pulled out a copy of the photo Harris had sent to the teen. After she identified it, Boring received the judge's permission to publish it to the jury. I'm sorry, the prosecutor said. He then held the photo up and walked the length of the jury box, his eyes looking down. The girl testified she eventually told Harris she was really just 15 years old. But that didn't seem to deter him one bit. He told me he wanted me to make him a naughty old man, she testified. The next witness wasn't a juvenile when she began exchanging messages and explicit photos with Harris. She was 19. Jacqueline Robledo caught Harris's attention on Whisper when she posted she'd just seen the movie Fifty Shades of Grey. Here's Boring asking her what happened next. What was the nature, generally, of your message? Um, just back and forth. Um, everyday stuff, and then there was also sexual as well. And would this involve uh, him sending photographs of his body to you? Yes. And uh, vice versa? Yes. Um, 
during this time, did the defendant ever try to get you to meet up with him or anything of that nature? Very often. Robledo said this occurred in the summer of 2013 when she was going through a terrible breakup. One night, on the spur of the moment, she agreed to meet Harris at his home. Um, he was there waiting because I texted him that I was there. And when you, when you went inside, tell the ladies and the gentlemen and the jury what happened. Well, we had sex. Um, did he seem nervous or anything? Not at all. Harris had told her his wife had gone out for the evening. They had sex on the living room sofa, Robledo said. Here's Harris's lead attorney, Maddox Kilgore, asking her about the rendezvous. Is it fair to say you, you actually referred to it as sort of a booty call hookup? Um, one night stand. One night? Yes. Okay. And that one night stand um, actually was a very quick encounter, wasn't it? Yes. Um, I believe you told detectives you were in and out. Yes, sir. When questioned by Boring, Robledo said something completely unexpected. Do you remember a chat uh, from February 2014 where he talked about that, meeting a random person? I do. Tell the jury about that. Um, he mentioned that he was on vacation and that he had met up with a guy and had relations with him. Defense attorney Kilgore tried to make the best of the situation. He reminded Robledo what Harris had told her about Cooper. And you asked uh, Ross, and your little son? And what was his response? Not the best ever. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And he sent you a little picture of Cooper, didn't he? Yes, sir. And you responded, so adorable. I love his eyes. And, you're, and he responded, he's the best. Okay. And it's those type of um, communications regarding Cooper that led you to be able to you know, give that opinion to the police department that Ross loved his son, right? Right. We're not done, no, not even close. I told you the prosecution was going to slime Harris with hours of testimony about his sexual promiscuity and deviant behavior. So far, they've called nine women to show just that. The next day, Boring called Caitlin Hickey Floyd to the stand. She said she and Harris exchanged explicit photos during the 15 days leading up to Cooper's death. Prosecutor Boring then walked up to the witness stand with two photos. He showed them to the witness. Floyd blanched. She could barely speak. And what is that? I showed me. Okay. And what are you wearing? A Batman shirt. Okay. Did you hear that? She said, not very much. And was this uh, a picture included in the chats between you and the defendant? Yes. Boring spared her. He didn't show that photo to the jury. Floyd, who was single at the time, is now married. Can you imagine being called to the witness stand for something like this in such a high-profile trial? Boring then turned Floyd's attention to chat she had with Harris on June 4th, just two weeks before Cooper's death. Around 6.30 that morning, Harris sent her explicit photos of his business. It prompted this exchange. I asked him if he was alone. And what did he say? I'm not. Did you ask him a follow-up question? I said, well, that's risky of you. And then what did he respond? I'm very risky. Later that night, Harris let her know he was the lead guitarist at his church. Because of the way this was going, did you ask him a question? I did. I asked him, but then you still exercise the thought of being with someone else when you're married. Okay. And how did he respond to that question? Yep. Did you ask him a question after that? I asked him if his conscience ever kicked in. He replied with, nope. Harris asked Floyd to meet up with him so they could have sex in public. She refused, said she didn't want to get arrested. Finally, Boring turned his attention to June 18, 2014, the day Cooper died. Harris started the day by messaging Floyd at 5.49 a.m., telling her good morning. We all know what happened later. Harris took Cooper to breakfast, his last meal, at Chick-fil-A. While there, Harris exchanged messages with another woman on Whisper, an exchange prosecutors also got into evidence last week. The woman, who's never been identified, posted, I hate being married with kids. The novelty is worn off and I have nothing to show for it. Harris, sitting next to Cooper at breakfast, messaged back, I love my son and all, but we both need escapes. Ten minutes later, Harris got out of his SUV in the Home Depot parking lot, leaving Cooper strapped inside. That afternoon at 1.17 p.m., while Cooper was still out in his car, Harris and Floyd struck up another online chat. Harris said he was at work, 
and asked her to send him a photo of her breasts. How did you respond? LOL, maybe, if you asked nicely. And did he, did he say anything else? He said, please, madam. And did you uh, send him a photograph after that? Floyd said she did, and she also asked Harris if he wanted to play with them. Using an expletive, Harris said yes. And did you respond? I did. Okay, what did you say? Oh, well, good things come to those who wait. And how did he respond? Wait, I shall. They ended their chat at 2.07 p.m. Harris would be arrested hours later. He's been in custody ever since. On Thursday, it was Janie Meadows' turn to take the stand. She said she was an 18-year-old college student in middle Georgia when she struck up an online relationship with Harris in 2013. The chats, of course, quickly turned sexual, and Harris sent her photos of his penis. Here's Boring asking Meadows how things progressed. Can you tell, tell the jury a little bit about what was your relationship like with him at the time, with the defendant? Um, I, I guess I fell in love with him. Meadows said they began messaging each other just about every day. They'd start early in the morning and continue till evening. They'd also talk on the phone. What did Harris say? He told me that he loved me. One day while she was out shopping, Harris showed up at that very store, miles away from Atlanta. I was actually in the store picking out some things for my friend that had just moved into her dorm. And he called me and asked me what aisle I was on. They talked and kissed. Then he had to leave. He told her he had to pick up Cooper. It was the last time they'd meet in person. At first, Harris didn't tell her he was married and had a son, but he eventually told her the truth. As for Cooper? He just talked about how much he loved him and how he would never do anything to hurt him and that kind of thing. Defense attorney Kilgore spent a great deal of time going through a lengthy series of messages between Meadows and Harris. It went on and on. Meadows grew impatient often glaring at Kilgore. At one point, when Kilgore was looking down at a document, Meadows looked out into the courtroom gallery. She shook her head and mouthed, Please, stop. But no one could help her, and Kilgore continued on. When Boring had another chance to question Meadows, she gave him answers he wanted to hear. Sometime in the summer of 2013, she said, Harris sent her this message. It just made me realize how unhappy I can be sometimes. If he wasn't in the picture, I would have probably left her, I probably would have left L by now. And I said, left L, and that's Leanna. And he said, yes. And I said, oh. And then I said, but that isn't a reason to stay with someone, Ross. And then he said, and then I started thinking about how much I actually like you. I know, but it's hard, Jamie. There were other women who testified about having sexually explicit online chats with Harris. But the final one, well, the final one so far, to testify for the state took the witness stand on Friday. She's the teenager listed in the indictment for counts 6, 7, and 8. One count is a felony with a possible sentence of up to 10 years in prison, persuading a girl under 18 to send him lewd photos of herself. The two others are misdemeanors, each with punishment up to one year behind bars. One is sending verbal accounts of sexual excitement and sexual conduct to the girl. The other, sending a photo of his erect penis to her. And yes, from the evidence presented in the teenager's testimony, the jury should have no problem finding Harris guilty of these three counts. Once again, the judge ordered this woman's identity to be shielded and no recording of her testimony. She was a 16-year-old high school junior when she struck up the online relationship with Harris. She's now 19, and like Meadows, she said she fell in love with him. She never actually met up with Harris, but she engaged in online chats with him for about eight months. One of the last messages she sent to him was on the day of Cooper's death. She included a photo of her breasts. She sent it at 2.10 p.m. while Harris was still at work. And yes... She was the second person to do such a thing that awful day. The woman said Harris let her know he was married and had a son named Cooper. When defense attorney Kilgore asked her if she thought Harris would do anything to hurt his child, she answered, no, definitely not. I know, I can only imagine what the jurors must have been thinking. On a practical level, how did Harris keep track of all these women? He was messaging several of them during the same time period, often on the same day. He sent so many messages during the day, you wonder, how did he get any work done? 
and he'd often send messages until well after midnight and then follow up the next morning before 6 a.m. How did he ever get any sleep? More importantly, though, is all of this enough to prove motive? Well, it helped convince the jury that Harris was so obsessed with sex, he wanted his son dead so he could have more, more, more. Or is any of this relevant to the ultimate question? Also last week, two of Harris's buddies, Winston Milling and Alex Hall, testified about what happened on Cooper's last day. All three men graduated from the University of Alabama with the same major. They all now worked for Home Depot, and they had plans to start up their own software company. They went out to lunch together several times a week, and they ate lunch at Publix on the day that Cooper died. Obviously, a key question for Harris's friends, Winston Milling and Alex Hall, was how Harris behaved that day. If he intentionally left his son in his car to die, was he showing any signs of this weighing on his mind? Here's Kilgore asking Milling if he noticed anything. He was behaving in a normal way like you had known him for the last year or two, however long you've been working together. Yes. <laughs> in fact, <coughs> After this happened, you and Alex got together and you racked your brains trying to think, is there anything, anything, anything that was going on that we missed? You all came up with nothing. Correct. You didn't notice that he was on the cusp of some sort of a breakdown during those two weeks before the 18th, did you? Not that I recall, no. And you certainly didn't notice it on the 18th? No. Alex Hall said the same thing. Nothing unusual. Hall also made a startling disclosure that answered a question that has weighed on many people's minds since Harris's probable cause hearing in July 2014. That's Child Free. We've talked quite a bit about Child Free in prior episodes. Here's Boring referring to it during that probable cause hearing little more than two weeks after Cooper died. It proves motive because he was unhappy in his marriage. We plan to show that he wanted to live a child-free life or there's evidence to suggest that based on his internet searches. The searches were made on the vast social media network reddit.com, which posts news and commentary about all sorts of topics. Some topic areas are classified as subreddits. Here's lead detective Stoddard dropping the child-free bombshell at the probable cause hearing. This provided some of the most damaging testimony against Harris, testimony that helped convict him in the minds of many. He went to a subreddit, it was called Child Free. And Child Free is a people who advocate living child free. Um, they advocate not having any more children and adding to the, the biomass, I guess is the best way they put it. So if Harris was showing a keen interest in Child Free, that's certainly motive, right? Incredibly damning. But since then, the prosecution has been reluctant to include child-free web searches as a basis for motive. At a hearing in October 2015, Stoddard acknowledged Harris looked at three posts on the child-free subreddit, and those posts had nothing to do with ridding yourself of children. But Stoddard wasn't willing to completely let it go, and defense attorney Kilgore wasn't either. So when we heard about child-free, as relates to motive, mm -hmm. is that what you were talking about? That's the side I was talking about, yes. That's it? Okay. None of that suggests that he adheres to some philosophy of murdering his child, does it? No, sir. No. But it sounded good in the probable cause hearing, didn't it? It sounds good now. It's still a child-free site that he went to. Sure. He clicked on multiple times. Curious, maybe? Maybes. Maybes. In his opening statement at the start of this trial, Prosecutor Boring made absolutely no mention of the child-free web searches. None. That spoke volumes about how much things have changed. And during the trial, the prosecution didn't bring it up. Defense attorney Kilgore did. Here he is questioning Harris's friend, Alex Hall, about an internet chat Hall and Harris had while they were both at work on April 29, 2014. That's just weeks before Cooper's death. What you say to, to Ross there, excuse me, what you say in the chat is, so R backslash child free exists. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you, do you remember typing that and sending that? 
Um, I probably yeah, I probably saw it on like the front page, something like that, of the website, and then and then try to do it. All right. When you say you saw it on the front page of the website, what what you mean is you saw it on the Reddit homepage. Correct. Yeah. Just to be clear, Hall had typed R backslash child free exists. The R was their shorthand for Reddit. You don't subscribe to that philosophy, do you? Of of uh, people never to have children. No, uh, no. I was I was making fun of it in that comment. So I was going to... because it's ridiculous. The way they go about it is ridiculous. Yeah. Right. You agree that you um, you found this child free on the uh, face page of Reddit, yep. on the homepage of Reddit. Yep. And you put it out there in the chat. Mm -hmm. And did you see what Ross's response was? Yeah, he wasn't for it. He wasn't for it, was he? Nope. In fact, his response was grossness. Yep. You've never heard Ross subscribe to Living Child Free, have you? Nope. You've never known him to join any group subscribing to a philosophy of Living Child Free, have you? Nope. But within 20 seconds of you putting that out there on the chat, he responded, grossness. Yep. Wow. So this means the child-free searches Boring and Stoddard referred to at that probable cause hearing to support motive appear to show nothing like that at all. Nothing. At the outset, Harris didn't go searching for child-free. It was sent to him by his buddy as a joke. And then, after checking it out, Harris's first response? Grossness. I only wonder what the court of public opinion would have thought if all of this had been made clear two years ago. As for the court in Brunswick, the Harris jury probably didn't know what Hall was talking about. Like I said, the prosecution had made no mention of Child Free. But you can be sure the jury will hear it again. I expect the defense will try to use it to show police were jumping to conclusions at a time they were hell-bent on charging Harris with his son's murder. Also last week, prosecutors continued presenting testimony from witnesses who said Harris didn't act like a grief-stricken father on the day of Cooper's death. Prosecution witness Mark Wilson testified he was in a holding cell at the Cobb County Jail, serving out a DUI sentence when Harris was locked up. Here's Boring asking Wilson about what happened. Uh, when you were sitting there in jail, um, in, in that holding area, when Mr. Harris came in, could you describe to the jury uh, what he said initially and how he was acting? Uh, when he first walked in, he looked at everyone and just said, what's up, guys, and uh, acted pretty calm and nonchalant. Did he seem sad at all? Not at all. Seemed upset? No. Boring showed the jury a surveillance video from inside the jail. Harris can be seen sitting next to Wilson and appearing composed and relaxed. But the video contained no audio, so we don't know what was said. And there's one more thing about Wilson's story. He didn't first go to the police with this information. Instead, he sold it to the National Enquirer for $2,000. While the prosecution continued to present testimony about Harris's unaffected behavior, he showed plenty of emotion last Tuesday when Brian Frist, Cobb County's former chief medical examiner, took the stand. During Frist's testimony, Prosecutor Jesse Evans showed the jury several full-color autopsy photos of Cooper. Some jurors covered their faces with their hands. Others looked away. Harris broke down crying when Evans began asking Frist to describe how Cooper died from hypothermia. Harris grabbed tissues, covered his face with his hands, and shook with sobs. Here's Frist's description of what happened to Cooper that day. He was left in a, in a motor vehicle, uh, which was parked which over time heated, and as a result of the car, the internal uh, compartment of the car heating, Cooper got heated, but that took time because it started off uh, cool, and over time it got hotter and hotter and hotter until it reached a, a point where uh, Cooper's temperature got uh, beyond the, the point of irreversibility and he passed. Would this have a, some sort of physical or painful effect on Cooper Harris? I believe that he went through various stages as he was passing, yes. And can you explain that for the jury, please? The phases he would have experienced, he would have ex experienced, you know, likely a nausea, he would have had a headache, 
he would become dehydrated, he may have had seizures, uh, he would have had, uh, even at his young age, he would have had anxiety, because uh, he's been in a car seat before, and he's just strapped in there, and he probably uh, would have struggled as he was becoming more and more uncomfortable. And as a result of that, he may have, uh, he may have uh, as I said, uh, rubbed his head or face or body parts against something that was hot, causing him to have pain. He may have scratched himself. He had all these potential po po possibilities. But most prominently, uh, I believe that he definitely went through the various phases of, of having a headache and probably had nausea and may have had some seizure activity prior to becoming unconscious and, and passing. That testimony was hard to listen to. Frist testified that he was unable to pinpoint the time of Cooper's death, but he thought it was possible that Cooper was still alive when Harris returned to his car at lunchtime with the light bulbs. During that lunchtime visit, the temperature inside Harris's car was about 98 degrees, an expert hired by Cobb police testified on Wednesday. That would not have been hot enough to raise Cooper's internal temperature by another 7 degrees, causing his death. If that's true, that's a harrowing thought on two levels. If Cooper was still alive, was he making noise that Harris chose to ignore? Or, if Harris had accidentally left his son in the car, could he have saved his life if he had seen him inside the SUV? Just for the record, the expert, David Michael Branny, said he charged Cobb County taxpayers $24,000 for his work. He testified that his recordings indicate the temperature inside Harris's SUV peaked at 125 degrees around 3.30 that afternoon. The high temperature outside that day was 91 degrees. After Branny's testimony, I exchanged emails with Jan Null. He's a California meteorologist who runs the website noheatstroke.org. I interviewed him in a prior episode. In a message last week, Null said he found Branny's calculations to be too conservative. A recent test Null conducted on an 84-degree day recorded 135-degree temperatures inside a vehicle, he said. So is it possible Harris's car was much hotter when he arrived at lunchtime that day? In episode 11, we took a good bit of time to go over the smell of death testimony, and I think I need to wrap it up with this episode. Detective Stoddard first made note of it in the preliminary hearing when he said Harris's SUV had an odor of, quote, decomposition or death, unquote. As Breakdown listeners know, we've interviewed former medical examiners who said that wasn't possible. It seems undisputed that Cooper had been dead for a few hours when Harris left work that afternoon at 4.15. That was too early for a smell from decomposition to emanate from his body, the medical examiner said. Frist, when asked last week, said the same thing, but he also said there was very likely some smell from inside Harris's SUV. I don't believe that you had decompositional smells per se. Right. Uh, the way, in other words, not that you all would know. <laughs> but as a, as a forensic pathologist, when I come to work in the morning, I can tell immediately whether we have a body that's decomposed or not. I don't think that type of a smell was there. But I do believe that, especially as we get to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, where we know the temperatures in the internal compartment of the car did really get significantly heated, that you would have the stale odor of someone who's been breathing for a long, for a period of time, who's been sweating for a period of time, who uh, has had, may or not have some gases released from his GI tract. He's uh, urinated. And I know we all have an impression when you go to a car that's, that's out in the heat and you open the door, you get hit with this blast of air. We all, have it. we all have our own opinion of what that feels like and what it smells like. Brian Lumpkin, one of Harris's lawyers, took another shot at trying to pin Frist down. With regards to the decompositional smell, you said that in your opinion, you do not believe there was a smell of decomposition. Right. Per se, that's correct. I just believe there was a stale smell. There was a, there was a different smell than normal. So, were Cobb police giving what turned out to be misleading testimony about the smell of death? wittingly or unwittingly? It appears so. 
But regardless, there seems to be little doubt there was some kind of smell in Harris's SUV when he got back inside at the end of the day. And it was interesting to finally hear the Cobb medical examiner's take on it. Then on Friday, a moment many of us have been waiting for finally arrived. Please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury by telling them your name and spelling it so the court gets it right. Good morning. I'm Phil Stoddard. I'm a detective with the Cobb County Police Department. Yes, lead detective Phil Stoddard took the witness stand. And when court adjourned Friday, he was still on it in the early phases of his direct examination. I expect him to remain on the stand for at least two more days. Through Stoddard's testimony, prosecutors were able to play recordings of Harris being interviewed shortly after his arrest and when he met his wife at the police station. Prosecutors contend Harris was faking his sorrow on both occasions. The defense says Harris was in shock and genuinely grief-stricken over the loss of his little boy. I can see how both sides make their case. I can't wait to hear what the jury thought about it. I'm going to play you some snippets from these recordings, which total more than two hours of audio. First, here's Harris alone in the interrogation room, waiting for the detectives to come talk to him. He paces. He grabs his hair. He puts his face on the table. And there are times he wails out in grief. Stoddard and another detective finally entered the room. Harris agrees to answer the detective's questions without a lawyer present. Here is Harris saying what happened that day. He said he was running a bit late. I got my stuff together for work. I put I laid out what I was going to wear. Um, I put him in his room, let him play with his toys. I put him in his room, let him play with his toys. And he's playing with his toys. He's watching um, some cartoons that we we play for him. And by the time I got all the morning stuff done before I get ready, it was about seven fifty, eight o'clock. And so I thought, well, oh, this is a great. I knew I knew this was going to happen. Let's let's go ahead and get breakfast together. Now let's make that today. That's what I did. That was the biggest mistake of my life. Harris said his time with Cooper at Chick Fil A was special. It was one of the only occasions they got to spend daddy-son time together. He then talked about leaving the restaurant. So we're leaving Chick-fil-A. I put him in his car seat. And gave me a kiss on the cheek. Like I always do. I always put him in his car seat. I make sure he's strapped in real tight. According to all the regulations that we watched on YouTube and everything. I strapped him in. I tightened him up. I gave him a kiss. He gave me a kiss. What I do every time, it's my routine. I, I let him know I love him. I give him a kiss. Because I do that because if for some reason, God forbid, we're in an accident, I want him to, and I, had, and I died, I would hope he'd have a memory of me, you know, telling him every time the last time he sees me that I love him. And he gave him a kiss. And just today was just, the careless I got in my car, and instead of going from here to here, I went straight to work, which is, I turned on to Cumberland, and I drove down Cumberland Boulevard. I went to work, as if he wasn't even in the back. And I probably didn't even hear him because he falls asleep really easily when, when you drive a car. Harris then told the detectives how he found out Cooper was still in his car that afternoon on his way to the movie. He saw something when making a lane change. As I was turning, I was, I was driving down um, Acres Mill. Acres Mill. Um, as I was driving down Acres Mill, I caught a glimpse of him in my, when I looked to my right to change lanes. I caught a glimpse of him in the back. I thought I saw him. I thought I was seeing things. And then I saw him. And then I lost him. Harris said he pulled into the Acres Mill Square parking lot. He pulled Cooper from the car tried to perform CPR, but couldn't compose himself. He said he knew his son was dead. 
I saw him laying there. And he's, he had that stare in his face. I knew he was coming. Did you take him out of the car seat? I did. I knew that I had done what every parent in their life fears they've done, and that's just leave their son in the car on a hot day. And I lost it. I just started screaming. I started yelling. I screamed. I don't even remember what I yelled. I was just freaking out. And then that then um, and you guys arrived. During the interview, Harris said he realized how he made such a horrible mistake. Explain to me how this happened. How do you, how do you think this happened? I have, there are occasions where in the morning after I drop him off, mm -hmm. I'll go to Chick-fil-A because it's, it's on the way. And uh, all those times I'll always get to the drive through I never go inside by myself. And I'll leave Chick-fil-A and when I turn out of Chick-fil-A, I'll turn on the Cumberland. Mm -hmm. I'll take that U-turn and I'll go straight to him. And I, just, I don't know if my mom just said, that's what you're doing today. So just go to work. So I would never think of a car ride. So I had just watched news reports. There was a news report of a guy who, who did this, mm -hmm. just like me. And now he's an advocate for when you park, you turn around and look at you. And I've been doing that because the, the worst fear for, my, for me is to leave my son in a hot car. Finally, Stoddard told Harris he was going to be charged initially with cruelty to children. But Harris took exception and began to argue his case. And from everything I'm seeing, um, you're going to be charged. Okay. okay. With what? Right now, cruelty to child. Okay. Okay. And what, what information is this based off of? It's information based off that your son was in a hot car all day long. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's what we're, you know, that's... We're supposed to begin, and it is an investigation, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I got a lot of other stuff I need to look at. So what we're doing is so I'm going to have you have a seat here. I'm going to talk to your wife, and then I'll, I'll make my final determination, okay? It was completely unintentional. Okay. So I have no history of child abuse. I have no history of domestic violence. I have no criminal history. I have, I have no record whatsoever. I've worked in a law enforcement environment. I... Do you understand our concerns? Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm, you know, I'm a great father, and I have multiple people that would back that up, from daycare to my wife to Ross. We're not here to judge you. I know, I know. Okay. I just I got to look at, yeah. You know, I, I, I understand okay. that there's an incident that happened, right? You're going to ask me questions in which I have invoked my my right to mm -hmm. answer. Um, there are certain criminal statutes that you have to look at, and if you think that one of them meets the qualifications, that's your decision. I would like to say I highly disagree. Um, I mean, it's well, absolute accident. But to leave the child in the car all day long? On purpose, though. That's what I would look at cruelty. Well, and you know, and with cruelty too, it's, and it doesn't have to be you know, on purpose. Okay. I mean, cr to me, cruelty sounds By your like actions, I like my child. Well, it's, well, actions that you took today, you know, led up to the death of your child. Absolutely. Okay. But at the same token, it's not like I took, I left out of Chick-fil-A and said, and said, oh, he's going to be fine in the car. I would never do that. Well, by your, and I'm trying to explain it to you, by, by your actions, the actions that you took by not taking him to daycare, by leaving him in the car, Correct. caused his death. I, I, okay. I disagree slightly. Okay. But, but, I mean, that's... No, why do you disagree? I, I, I'd just rather not talk anymore. I mean, okay. if, if, if I'm going to be charged, I, I would like yeah. to have some kind of representation. Absolutely. Okay, and that is definitely your right. And we're going to end it. It is 731, and we'll end our interview. The detectives then sent Harris to a holding cell and interviewed his wife, Leanna Taylor, in the same interview room. After that was over, they allowed Harris to see Leanna. And, of course... They recorded everything. Harris immediately breaks down when seeing his wife, and they embrace. I love you, 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 I love you,
Harris explains how he left Chick-fil-A and went to work, that Cooper wasn't making a sound. He then told her about his discovery on the way to the movie. I'm, I'm just a brain fart from a routine, you know. I didn't, I just need everybody to know that it's absolutely the last thing I, like I wasn't doing it like saying, saying, because uh, the way they, the way they, they, the way that the charge sounds is like I knew he was back there. Harris told Leanna he was going to be charged with a crime. They're going to charge me with cruelty, child cruelty. That's why they put me back there in a the cell. I took my shoes, I took my belt. And I told him, I was like, it's not like I did this on purpose. I said, I got a million people that know that I love that boy with my life. Because of my actions, my actions resulted in his death. What does that mean? I don't know. They're gonna, but he said they're gonna charge me with, with child, with child cruelty. And I told him, I was like, it's not like I. Do we need to get you a lawyer? Yeah. I said it's not like I went to the grocery store and I said, oh, he's gonna be fine. I'm just gonna go in for 30 minutes. Did you say too much? No, I, I, all I did was tell him the events of the day. Harris continues sobbing, saying his life is over. Leanna continues to try and console him. She even asks him at one point if they can have more children together. Of course, at that time, Leanna had no idea of the extent of her husband's transgressions. Just earlier this very day, as we've said, he'd been messaging several women, two of whom sent him photos of their breasts. And of course, Leanna divorced Harris earlier this year. But in this interview room, Leanna said, We're going to make it through this. Okay? Look at me. We're going to make it through this. We're going to be that couple that makes it through this. Okay? Or, yes. I just don't want you to leave me for anything. I won't leave you, baby. You're, I love you're you. You're like my life support right now. I love you. Look at me. I love you. Harris told her he was going to be charged with a felony. He can't stop thinking of his jail cell with the metal toilet and uncomfortable cot. I'm going to lose my job, he said. Stoddard finally re-enters the room. He tells Harris he'll be transported to the Cobb County Jail and that he'll soon appear before a judge who'll decide whether Harris can post bond. Leanna then breaks in. Does it have to be like this? Does it have to be like this? Does it have to be like this? <laughs> to do this on purpose. Well, and like I said, you know, notwithstanding where, you know, intent or purpose or anything like that, um, his actions today, and you can even rise so far as say his negligence called the death of your son. Um, whether or not it was intended, whether or not it was, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it, by his actions, your son's dead. I have to charge him on that, okay? And we'll let a court handle it from there. Harris tells Leanna he'll be fine. They embrace again, and she tells him one last thing. Love you. I know you didn't do this on purpose. I know you didn't. Okay. I love you. Love you too. Next, on Breakdown. Detective Stoddard continues his testimony and is expected to undergo a withering cross-examination by Harris's lead lawyer, Maddox Kilgore. 
when you when you arrived at the uh, crime scene, did you speak with any supervisors, and were you told of what your role in the case was going to be? When I arrived on scene, um, Captain Farrell, uh, Lieutenant Farrell at the time, was our division commander. Um, arrived shortly after. Um, when we arrived, you get together with all the detectives, you kind of start doing a game plan. At that time, it was decided that I would be the lead detective in this case. Season two of Breakdown, Death in a Hot Car, Mistake or Murder, is a production of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The story is reported and told by Bill Rankin, produced by Richard Hallix. Audio production by Chris Basta of Bare Knuckles Creative. The music for Breakdown was composed and performed by Bo Emerson, Chris Nicholson, and Chris Basta. Special thanks to Burt Roten, Ross Cavett, Chris Nicholson, and Buddy Hall. 